All right, I would like to welcome everyone to the final uh, meeting of the International Security Speaker Series, which is sponsored and put on by the Robert F. Strauss Center for International Security and Law. And I would like to thank particularly uh, Elizabeth Roberts for her great work uh, in putting the event on. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> I'm particularly thrilled to be ending our year on such a high note with such an amazing speaker. The year after I graduated from college in 1989, uh, I was the same age, maybe a, a little bit younger than many of the students uh, that are here today. Um, and as I'm sure you can imagine, and for those of you who are closer to my age or even older, you can remember what a time of amazing and profound change uh, it was. Of course, I'm talking about the change, the transition in Eastern Europe from communi communism uh, to democracy. This tectonic shift was one few ever expected to see in their lifetime, and the excitement, worry, and uncertainty, uncertainty was extraordinary. It was those events that made me want to become a historian, that made me want to become a professor of international relations. The events of the last few months in the Middle East, and in particular Egypt, have, I'm sure you would all agree, a similar feel to them, as if something extraordinary and transformative was happening before our very eyes. How are we to make sense of these extraordinary events? What are the origins of this revolution? And what does the future hold for Egypt and for the larger Middle East? There is no one better qualified to help us discuss and understand these issues than our distinguished guest, Tarek Masood. Tarek comes to us from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, where he's a professor and a renowned expert on the politics of the Middle East. He was, to my mind, the most thoughtful commentator on the exciting events of the last few months. I'm sure many of you have seen him on television or read uh, his writings in the newspaper. Uh, particularly a very influential and widely distributed uh, op-ed in the New York Times. Uh, and he pretty much appeared on every major and important national uh, television news program, from Charlie Rose to, we were discussing the favorite one being Tavis Smiley. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that. But you, you named the venue, Tarek was the most thoughtful person on there. He was and is and remains the go-to guy <coughs> understand the profound changes of the past few months. His list of publications and awards is very impressive, and his forthcoming book on Islamic political parties is sure to drive debate on these critical questions for years to come. In short, Tark is a star. These qualifications, impressive though they are, are not why I'm happy Tark is here. I'm thrilled because Tark is one of my dearest friends, one of the smartest people I know, and a person whose values and character are a model what an ideal professor and a scholar should be. I'm proud to say I knew him when, and even prouder now that he's such a big star and he still talks to me. Tarek's talk is entitled Egypt, The Road to and From Revolution. Please join me in welcoming Tarek Masood and give him a warm message. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming today. and. Um, Thank you to uh, Professor Gavin, who um, uh, Frank and I uh, were both at the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia uh, many years ago. Frank is a newly minted PhD, and I as uh, you know, a wayward uh, youth. And it was actually Frank who convinced me to go and get a PhD. Um, he wanted me to do one in history, and I rebelled and did one in political science, which is why my IQ is a little lower than you know his. Uh, but you know, that's OK. I can, um, so, so again, thank you all for coming today. It's a great honor to be here at uh, the University of Texas and at the, uh, the LBJ School and to see uh, you know, so many people who are still interested uh, in this topic. <clears throat> Um, you know, we are now, as, as uh, Professor Gavin mentioned, witnessing this kind of season of revolt in the Middle East. We're seeing it from, it began in Tunisia, it spread to Egypt. Uh, we see it happening in Libya. We see it potentially happening in Bahrain, in Yemen, and uh, maybe even in Syria. And, uh, you know, so to help us kind of understand what's happening in this, in this part of the world, I think it's important for us to go back to and think about uh, Egypt, because Egypt, I think it's, it's sort of we could say it's almost uncontroversially, is the most important country in the world. Uh, that was a joke. Uh, it was, it, 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 
it actually, that, that statement, though, was made by somebody very important. Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, when he began his exile on the Isle of St. Helena, had an interview with, his, um, with the warden. And he told the warden, in fact, you know, the warden said, like, why did you go to Egypt? Why did you engage in this crazy adventure? And he said, Egypt is the most important country in the world. From his standpoint, it was important because of its agricultural resources, its position at the crossroads of great empires. Uh, but I think it's certainly the most important country in the Middle East, because if we look at every important political or ideological movement in the Arab world and in the Middle East, um, it's emerged from Egypt. So the cause of Arab nationalism right, found its greatest exponent in Gamal Abdel Nasser, Egypt's uh, leader from 1952 to 1970. Egypt led the Arab world in the cause of Arab nationalism. The, the, the peace and war with Israel. Egypt was always first at war with Israel and then first uh, in, to lead the Arab countries into peace with Israel. Political Islam, this ideology uh, that seeks to refashion uh, political institutions and perhaps the world in line with a particular vision of the faith of Islam, this too finds its greatest thinkers in the Muslim world, both uh, people like uh, Sayyid Qutb, who was a, a leading ideologue of the Muslim Brotherhood, to when we think more in more contemporary terms, the number two of Al-Qaeda, the main thinker of Al-Qaeda, uh, not Osama bin Laden, a Saudi. If you know anything about the Saudis, you know, well, uh, you know, it's an Egyptian. It's an Egyptian, uh, Ayman al-Zawahri. And of course, the, the grim events of 9-11, that great crime perpetrated against our country, the operational leader of that uh, operation was an Egyptian, Mohammed Atta. So Egypt is a very important place. And as one former CIA analyst of the region said, as goes Egypt, so goes the rest of the Middle East. So it's very important for us to, if we really want to know where the region is going and how these revolutions and uprisings are going to shake out, it's very important for us to focus on Egypt and not lose sight of Egypt, even though maybe things in Libya are a bit more uh, interesting or events in Yemen may uh, draw our attention away. For the revolution in Egypt and the way that ends up is going to be hugely important for the rest of the world, so uh, the rest of the Middle East. So what I'm going to try to do in this talk today is two things. I'm going to try to draw on my research uh, of, the, of the Middle East and of Egypt to answer two different but related questions. The first is, how did we get to revolution, right? The road to revolution. And because I'm a kind of you know, dumb political scientist, a part of what I'm interested in is understanding like why we didn't see it. Why did we not think this was going to happen? Um, uh, you know, I, in September of 2010, so we're not, not very long ago, wrote, you know, democratic revolution in Egypt is very unlikely. So why, wh why were we unable to see this? And then, I, so that's the first question. Um, and then the second question I want to answer or think about is, what are the chances that this revolution will move from, you know, merely having unseated a dictator to actually having installed a genuine democracy? Um, <clears throat> so... You know, when I think about political science and what my discipline has to offer and has, has said about, you know, places like Egypt, well, Egypt was kind of the model of durable authoritarianism, okay? Uh, it was a kind of new type of dictatorship that was supposed to be really resilient and able to deal with the kind of political and economic challenges that frequently did in the lesser variants of the autocratic regime type. And one of the greatest sort of thinkers about this actually is our uh, friend and my uh, uh, teacher on this is uh, Professor Jason Brownlee. Um, who you know recognizes? So this is a, a you know standard political science model, completely unintelligible to anybody with a brain. Um, but basically, this is a kind of model of top-down democratization. A uh, Polish political scientist uh, named Adam Chaworski, you know, you know, play, drew out this game tree, and he says, you know, democratization happens in authoritarian regimes when liberalizers, soft liners within the regime, decide to open up the system. So what he's saying is basically, to, to get democracy, the processes that get you democracy, and I don't want to talk about the model, but it starts with a split in the regime where you've got some soft liners who try to, um, who, who, uh, um, who, who open up the system. 
And Professor Brownlee has put this in a, in a different way, but basically what he said is, look, elite splits are the thing that brings down, bring down authoritarian regimes. When the elite splits, the regime is no longer durable. And to quote uh, Jason, intra-elite conflict can escalate, uh, leaders polarize into competing fa factions, driven by pragmatism as much as principle, careerist figures then defect from the regime and ally with the opposition, former regime supporters become reluctant reformists. So splits in the, in the regime are very dangerous. And what you know, authoritarian regimes like that of uh, our friend Hosni Mubarak did was figure out, a, figure out ways to manage and, and forestall elite conflict. That's what we thought was so brilliant about this kind of regime. And one of the main institutions that they set up to do this, as uh, Professor Brownlee has argued, are ruling parties. Okay? So this is the headquarters of the uh, Egyptian National Democratic Party uh, after the revolution. You can't see it very well, but it's in flames. It was burned down. Um, this was a party actually founded by uh, Hosni Mubarak's predecessor, Anwar Sadat. But during Hosni Mubarak's uh, rule, it basically became a big kind of catch-all party in which pretty much every significant elite segment of society was co-opted. So if you're a businessman, come on into the party. If you're an intellectual or an academic, come on into the party. This was a big tent that was precisely designed to help manage conflict and prevent conflict from emerging among these elite supporters of the regime. And I think this is a very important insight into why these regimes or this regime was uh, able to survive for so long. Um, you know, this is, God, uh, can, can we like make this visible or no? I've invested so much time in the pictures. OK. Well, you cannot see this at all, but this is actually a, 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 um, uh, an image of three figures from the ruling regime, one businessman, one intellectual. Uh, that's fine. That's OK. Don't worry about it. Oh, the other images are better than this. Turn the lights on. I'm getting depressed now. OK. OK. So that's fine. Don't worry about it. So, so anyways. Um, uh, so, but th that's what the, this ruling party was supposed to do. It drew in lots of people, got people invested in the regime. The problem, though, was twofold. First, um, you know, you know, uh, it actually created some resentment among a segment of the elite that you absolutely need to hold on to in order to maintain power, and that's the military. So, Egypt, the Egyptian military, sees this ruling party that's becoming a significant institution, that's got all of these segments of the elite within it. Okay? It even has a young leader, not charismatic, um, the, the, the son of the president, Gamal Mubarak. Um, but it becomes increasingly clear to the military that the next leader of Egypt is going to emerge from this ruling party. Okay? It may be him, okay, which is what lots of Egyptians were upset about, or it could be somebody else. But it looked like it increasingly was going to come from that party. And the Egyptian military, which had been the fountain of political authority in that country for, you know, since 1952, did not look kindly on this. Okay. They were not uh, you know, comfortable with the idea that authority would shift from them to this corrupt civilian ruling party. And so instead of strengthening the regime, the presence of this ruling party and the expansion of this ruling party and the institutionalization of this ruling party such that it came to be viewed by the men with guns as a threat to them actually I think is one of the reasons that when push came to shove and when the Egyptian military had to make a decision, do we fire on the protesters or do we uh, allow them to continue with their revolution, at the end of the day they decided to side with the people or to at least not side with the regime because this was a regime that are, if, if, if it survived it would only bring this ruling party to power which they had no investment in. So instead of strengthening this particular regime um, at a particular point in time this ruling party actually I think weakened it because it created this resentment among the military. The second institution that we think about when we think about the strengthening of, of authoritarianism in Egypt uh, are, is uh, parliaments and elections. Okay? 
So Egypt is a dictatorship, or was a dictator, well, it still actually is a dictatorship, but hopefully it'll become a democracy. Um, and it has this parliament uh, that there are elections to every six years, and, um, uh, you know, 400, well, now it's 508 members. Um, and uh, this was thought to be a very significant factor in uh, promoting regime longevity. Why, right? Well, these elections were kind of rigged. They weren't great. But they were also a really good tool for managing elite conflict, right? These elites that you've got to you know, co-opt and get invested into the regime, well, you now have elections so they can compete with each other for the spoils of power. Um, but it's a way to, instead of now Mubarak having to decide, you know, Frank gets X and Will gets Y, you know, we can have an election and, and they can figure it out uh, that way. So it's supposed to be an important tool for managing elite conflict as well. In addition, these elections are supposed to do another thing, right? They're supposed to invest not only elites in the regime, they're supposed to invest all of us in the regime, right? So there's this argument that there's a kind of tragic brilliance, not my term, to elections in authoritarian regimes where, you know, poor people will go and vote for their, you know, big, you know, local chiefs because they know getting their chief into office is the surest way that the chief will be able to get them jobs and uh, you know, uh, electrify their villages and, and bring sewage uh, uh, and, and water and all of that stuff. So in a way, it's a way of getting the people invested in uh, voting for uh, this uh, autocratic regime. And you know, so you know, this is a photograph from my field research in Egypt. Uh, you know, what you'd have is like local uh, candidates of the ruling party would go into their districts and they'd build, you know, clinics and they'd do all this kinds of stuff that would get poor people to vote for them. And there's a very big finding in the literature on authoritarianism in Egypt that shows that, in fact, if you look at, you know, in the United States or in, in Western Europe, when we think about who votes, we generally argue that the more educated you are, the more likely you are to vote. Right? In p countries like Egypt, it's the exact opposite. So this is illiteracy and this is turnout, and these circles represent uh, e Egyptian electoral districts. In fact, the, the more illiteracy you have, the higher turnout you have in Egyptian elections. Okay? So less educated people. This is a colleague of ours at Stanford actually uh, made this finding, but it's actually a pretty old finding in the Egyptian literature that basically rural poor areas are much more likely to go out and vote than urban um, educated areas. And in large part, that's because uh, we thought that you know, poor people have more of a need to go and vote for the local notables who are then going to go and bring them uh, the goods. So this is a, a pretty decent finding. We all believed it. We all thought it was important. The problem is that, so we've just showed you a positive relationship between illiteracy or poverty and turnout. The problem is that turnout in Egyptian elections was really low. 23% in the 2005 elections. In the last elections, they said it was 25%. In one district where you know, uh, you know, some, uh, this, uh, some politicians I know actually tried to count turnout, the figure was closer to 9%. Um, so, you know, and yet poverty in that country is huge, right? So lots of poor people were not voting in this system. The idea that somehow this system was getting all of the poor to go out and vote for it can't exactly be right because we know for a fact the turnout was very low. So lots of people were not feeling invested in this regime. The other thing, the other argument I would make about both of these institutions that are thought to strengthen authoritarianism is that I actually think they contain within them the seeds of their own destruction. So these are some young guys, uh, members of the April 6th movement, who are protesting in front of the Egyptian parliament. Um, you know, their banner here says, shot us. They mean shoot us. Uh, basically, they were protesting, and one member of the ruling party said, all of these protesters should be shot. So then they went out and made banners and say, said, shoot us, right? Now, who were these young people that actually, you know, stoked the revolution in Egypt? Where did they get trained? Where did they begin their political evolution? It all happened in during elections in authoritarian regimes, in uh, op sort of sham opposition parties that the regime would allow to operate just to complete the democratic decor. 
So even here, I think, you know, if these institutions, these pseudo-democratic institutions, we think contribute to the longevity, longevity of these regimes, they also create organizing opportunities for potential opponents of those regimes. You open the door up a, a little crack, and then you create the opportunity for these people to force it open. It doesn't mean they're always going to do so, but you, it, they're certainly more likely to be able to do so than if the door isn't opened at all. So, why does this matter now? Is this just a kind of you know, purely historical inquiry? I actually don't think so. I think, you know, again, we're looking at other countries in the world and other countries in the Middle East. We're looking at Syria, and we're thinking, what is Bashar al-Assad going to do? How is he going to respond to the protests that we see in his country? And one of the arguments, one of the things we think he might do is open up the system just a little bit, open it up just a crack, and that will allow him to survive. And what I think that will do is actually set in train a process that will eventually bring it down. Thinking outside of the Middle East, Myanmar and Burma, the, the generals who rule that country have just made the decision. They've taken off their uniforms, and they're now civilians. And they have rigged elections that are just as, you know, just what you had in the Mubarak era. And we think, you know, smart people, right? We say, ah, oh, this is a sham. This is not real. This is not a real transition. The military is still running the show. But that, that's, which is absolutely true on one level. But they've also now had to set up these institutions that create the organizing possibilities for courageous young people to eventually force them open. So I think that we should be much more attuned in the future, in the Middle East and outside of the Middle East, to the possibilities for change that are created by these institutions that we think forestall change. So, um, so that, that's one thing. Now, the second question that I wanted to talk about, this is how we got here, or part of how, how, why we didn't see this happening, because we're so invested in explaining why these regimes are durable. The second thing I want to talk about today is what does our sort of study of the Middle East tell us about the prospects for uh, democratic consolidation uh, in uh, these places? And you know, I I'll focus on Egypt, although these problems are also being dealt with in Tunisia and in much the same way, actually. Uh, you know, it's remarkable how much the script in Egypt is also the script in Tunisia. And so I see five major challenges uh, to democratic consolidation in Egypt. So the first is, how do you get the military back to the barracks? Okay, the Egypt right now, the, the military uh, uh, compelled Mubarak to resign, and now the uh, higher council of the armed forces runs the country. So the first question is, how do you get them back to the barracks? The second is, now they've got to write a new constitution in Egypt. This is another, uh, uh, this is a, a, a task that the, the military has set for them. How are they going to manage this process? How are you going to cope with Islamists, Islamic fundamentalists, who we all uh, uh, might be concerned about as not necessarily being um, uh, 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 genuinely committed to democracy? Um, how do you deal with elements of the old regime, right? So you know, there's this big old regime out there. We've got to figure out what to do with them. And then finally, how do you make the revolution pay? Okay? So these are the five issues. How do you, the last one, how do you make the revolution pay? By this I mean, how do you actually get people to believe and be convinced that this revolution was a good thing for them? Okay? So I'm going to take each of these in turn. So the first is, how, will the military leave power? And because my brain is so infected with political science theory, I think that it's very, I'm just very surprised, um, or very skeptical, rather, of the, of, the, of the argument that they will leave power. Uh, this is a photograph of a refrigerator. Why am I showing you a photograph of a refrigerator? This is a refrigerator that is uh, manufactured in one of the military's uh, uh, factories. So the military owns all of these factories that produce all kinds of consumer goods. They also produce weapons and guns, but they produce consumer goods, including this nice refrigerator. And, so, and, and there have been estimates that the military holds between 10 to 40 percent of the Egyptian economy. Okay? The military also controls a huge amount of land in Egypt. Okay? So Egypt is mainly settled in the Nile Delta and along the Nile. And this is mainly desert. Okay? There's an oasis here. Um, the military, all, most of the land that exists outside of the settled areas actually officially belongs to the military. Okay? 
And one of the military's grievances, actually, during the uh, end of the Mubarak period, was that the Mubarak government was actually selling land, selling Egypt's land, or their land, to foreign investors and to, 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 crony, to cronies. But, so the military is a huge landowner as well. So they own factories and they own land. And they have huge prerogatives. And so on one level, you just think, why would they give these up? Right? Why would they actually give this up and, and turn uh, you know, control over to uh, democratically elected uh, governments? Especially since what we know in the political science literature, at least, or what we suspect, is that the holders of fixed assets, right? So you know, let's say I own a bunch of land. I'm a really rich guy in an autocratic regime, but my, the only thing I own is land. Okay? And now the rabble want democracy. And I know that once we get democracy, they're going to want to tax me massively. Okay? And all I hold is land. I mean, I can't escape with my money. It's land. I can't leave with it. So I will be hugely resistant to democracy. Whereas if all my assets are mobile, I've got like sacks of gold, OK, you guys want democracy? We can have democracy, because I can always leave. Okay? The military is the ultimate holder of fixed assets in Egypt. So why would they want to turn this over to democratically elected leaders when they know that you know, if, if you get a genuine democracy in Egypt, people are going to want to, they're going to want some redistribution. They're going to want to tax these assets that the military has. So at that level, democracy seems to me to be something that the military wouldn't think of as being in their interests. Okay? So that's one reason why I'm, I think to myself, there's no way the military is going to leave. The second reason that I think the military, that I would think the military wouldn't want to leave, is given by this, uh, I wish you could read this. Uh, this, um, this, uh, this is a, a, a picture of a little plaque about this big that was on a wall in a, a town in the Nile Delta called Zegazig, which actually my people are from. And uh, these little plaques you'll find all over this town, they're put up by the Muslim brothers. They're little blue uh, plaques. And they have little nice aphorisms on them. So they'll say things like, you know, smile. Um, you know, they'll say, like, you know, you know to, to, to women, like, wear the hijab, you know, don't get angry, let up, you know, nice little things. This is one of their banners, and it says, or one of their plaques, it says, Al Yahud hum al Yahud, Qatul al Anbiya wa Khan al Ahud, which means the Jews are the Jews. They kill prophets and violate their covenants, okay? So you've got to think to yourself, if you're the Egyptian military, which has fought wars with Israel it's, you know, and, and uh, not fared very well in those uh, battles, which has a very high um, you know, a, a, a degree of cooperation and alliance with the United States, the last thing you want is a democratic process that's going to bring to power people who might want to revise the relationship with Israel, who might be much more willing to engage in conflict with Israel. Right? And this is something we always hear about the Muslim Brotherhood. This is a, a huge opposition movement in Egypt, uh, one of the most successful and organized opposition movements in Egypt. And one of the core elements of their platform is opposition to Israel. They don't like what Israel does to the Palestinians, and they're opposed to it. So on one level, you might think the military wouldn't want that, wouldn't want, these guys, wouldn't want democracy, because it would think these guys would come to power. Then you get people like me, I actually study this movement, I say, Oh, no, no, you don't need to worry. They wouldn't actually win a majority of votes, etc. Actually, they're much more pragmatic than we think. But it's not even just the Muslim Brotherhood that is anti-Israeli. So this is a, a photograph of uh, some protesters from the Kifaya movement, which is one of the uh, you know, opposition uh, you know, sort of, uh, movements that I think was at the core of this revolution that happened in Egypt. They got started in 2004. Kifaya means enough. Enough Mubarak, enough corruption, enough of his family. And the, these were really the people who started, I think, the train that eventually um, uh, you know, got rid of uh, Mubarak. Well, one of the leaders of this uh, party, uh, Abdul uh, Halim Andil, uh, was, you know, was quoted recently as saying, we don't like Mubarak because we believe he's loyal to America and Israel, and therefore opposition to America and Israel are a core element of our platform of the Kafaya platform. Okay. So it's not just the Islamists. This guy's not an Islamist. He's a leftist. Uh, the leftists are not, uh, are, are not go likely, if they get elected, to, um, to keep the peace with Israel. This is a man 
named Megdi Hussein. Megdi Hussein is the president of a uh, sort of defunct party called the Egyptian Labor Party, right? Or the Socialist Labor Party, I should say. Um, Megdi Hussein, I've spent hours interviewing him because his father was the founder of a political party called Young Egypt in, 19, in the 1930s. Uh, the Young Egypt Party was explicitly modeled on the fascist uh, shirt organizations in Italy and Germany. They even had a, an anthem that went Egypt, Egypt overall, and um, they were, you know, they, the Nazi salute, all of these things. And, and he, if you think about his political thought, is no, represents no um, divergence from that of his father. And in fact, he just got out of jail recently. Uh, he was in prison because he snuck into Gaza. So again, on this issue, you know, there are all kinds of political forces, right? This is a, a leftist, uh, Nasserist uh, party leader who was asked in January before the revolution, you know, what, what do you think, you, are you going to run for president? He said, absolutely, the Egyptian people are tired. They want to say no to Israel and America. So if you're the military and you're looking at this, you're thinking, if we have democracy, this is going to create a huge security threat for us. Our, our democratically elected politicians are going to get us into trouble. And you might come back and say, well, wait a minute. There's great liberal people, the Vaclav Havel of Egypt, Ayman Noor. Well, if you were watching the news, Ayman Noor was um, somebody who ran against Hosni Mubarak in 2005. Of course, he lost. He's a, a, a liberal whose you know, democratic bona fides you cannot question. Uh, uh, he was imprisoned by the Mubarak regime. Well, just recently, after announcing his candidacy for the Egyptian presidency, he said that the Camp David Accords, this peace treaty between Egypt and Israel, needs to be revised. Okay? We need to have a popular referendum. So if you are the Egyptian military, this is the, 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 the current de facto leader, Minister of Defense, uh, Mohamed Tantawi. If you are the Egyptian military, you're looking at this, you're looking at the prospect that democracy will both undermine your economic fortunes and put you at great security peril. Why would you want to hand over power? Um, so I did tell you that you know, just a few months ago, I wrote an article saying that you know, democratic revolution was not likely to happen in Egypt. So um, I, I, you, know, you should know that I am eminently unqualified to explain anything that's going on in Egypt because despite what I've just told you, the military is taking very drastic steps that should demonstrate to anybody that they really do want to get out. So they have just amended, uh, initiated a process to amend the Constitution. Uh, and in fact, they did amend the uh, Egyptian constitution. Um, they're going to have elections in September of, uh, of 2011 that uh, will get a new parliament in there. So the military is making very credible uh, sounds about wanting to get out of power. And the only kind of explanation I can have for this is that they're looking at what happened to the military in Turkey. Right? So the military in Turkey, which ruled that country for a long time and was very deeply involved in the governance of that country, now in a more democratic Turkey, is one of the least legitimate political institutions in that country. And many former generals are actually being tried on charges of you know, conspiracy and, and, uh, and, and abu abuses of human rights. And the Egyptian military, for whatever reason, actually retains a great deal of credibility with the Egyptian people. So even though they were a key element of the Mubarak regime, the Egyptian people still love the military. And so the military, I think, is loath to give that up. It, 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 what it would like to do is, is transition to a kind of democratic process where most of its prerogatives are protected, where there are some red lines on the security file with Israel, but where generally they are not responsible for day-to-day -day running of the country. Okay? And one of the first things that they've uh, they've done in order to uh, set that in train is um, amend the uh, is is uh, a process to amend the constitution, which I'll get to in a minute. So, so they are having these elections in September 2011. Okay, that's what's next on the horizon in Egypt, and everybody is arguing that the people who are going to win those elections that are coming up are Islamists, are a party like the Muslim Brotherhood. So this brings us to this question of how do you deal with um, Islamic political parties, which are the most organized political force uh, in Egypt and um, might dominate uh, Egypt's future. And in fact, there are all kinds of predictions by you know, opposition party members that the Islamists are going to win. 
In fact, there are some, uh, some leaders of the Egyptian uh, you know, kind of democratic movement, including Mohammed al Baradi, who is um, the former head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, who said, uh, listen, why does the military want to get out so quickly? You guys should stay a while. Let's not have elections so fast. Uh, let some, the secular opposition forces, uh, secular parties rather, get their act together. Then we'll have an election. And the reason is that everybody there is thinking that these bearded guys, these Islamists, are actually going to win. Okay? So the first thing we want to think about is like, what is the likelihood that they would actually win in, a, in democratic elections? Well, if you look at the last time in Egypt they had an election that even approached um, being free and fair, and I mean it was like, I mean, it didn't come that close, but it came closer than any other election. Um, the ruling party obviously dominated, but the Muslim Brotherhood got 20% of the seats in parliament. And these tiny little bars represent, uh, represent uh, opposition parties. This is people who are independent. So if you just take this, as kind of reflective, if you take the opposition space as reflective of what might happen if you had free and fair elections, then you'd say, oh, it looks like the Islamists are really going to dominate. So we kind of try to you know, examine this, drill a little bit deeper. What I did was I counted up all the Muslim Brotherhood members in the in, in, uh, Muslim Brotherhood candidates in the 2005 elections, and I tried to look at how many votes they got. And this is actually just the Muslim Brotherhood members who actually won. This is a kind of histogram of Muslim Brotherhood members who actually won or entered runoffs in their district. And on average, they get about 35% of the vote. Right? The Muslim Brothers get 35% of the vote. And this is in the districts where they do really well. So maybe we should be a little bit, uh, you know, um, we shouldn't worry too much about the Muslim Brothers. But then you say to me, well, those are kind of rigged elections. They're not perfect. So I say, you're right. Maybe what we should do is try to survey people and ask them, you know, are you going to vote for the Muslim Brotherhood? Would you vote for the Muslim Brotherhood? And we're trying to do a survey like that right now. But in the Egypt of Mubarak, you could never do that. So uh, it's, you're not allowed to. So instead, what uh, I did was I, I said, well, maybe we should look at people's con information consumption patterns. Okay. So we can't actually find out directly if you, know, you want to vote for the Muslim Brotherhood. But I can find out if Egyptians are, in general, more interested in learning about the Muslim Brotherhood than they are in, in other political parties. And so this is a chart of Google searches um, uh, done from Egypt, okay, only from Egypt. Uh, for different political parties. So the three here are the National Democratic Party, which is the dark, uh, the dotted line, the Muslim Brotherhood, which is appropriately the green line, and the Waft Party, which is a liberal uh, secular opposition party, which is the blue line. I put in other parties too, but they don't even have enough search volume to register on this, on this graph. And this, um, it was done during the last parliamentary election, okay, where the Muslim Brotherhood only got one seat. Um, but what you see is that there was far more search volume for the Muslim Brotherhood than for any other political force. So you think to yourself, well, maybe, maybe this means that they would win an, uh, a free and fair election. And this is the, the same kind of chart, but for the 2005 elections. The Muslim Brotherhood, again, are the green line, and so hugely, hugely dominant. Right? So you might say, maybe this does mean that the Islamists are coming. That when you have a free and fair elections, uh, free and fair election, the Islamists will win, um, and so we just don't. We really don't know. And you know, if you look at the, if you look at what happened in 2005, where the Islamists won 20 percent of the seats, um, part of this was a function of the fact that very few Egyptians actually went out to vote. Right? Very few Egyptians actually participated in that election. So there are 32 million eligible voters in Egypt. Uh, only about 8 million people actually went out and voted in that election. And the Muslim Brotherhood got between 2.5 and 3 million of them. Okay? So that, that's really all we know. And you could then say, well, let, you know, if we do a survey of Egyptian political attitudes. So in, uh, in 2007, the Muslim Brotherhood came out with a party platform in which they said, uh, that one of the things that they wanted to do if they were actually allowed to uh, uh, you know, run Egypt was that they'd love to set up a committee of religious scholars who would vet all laws to make sure that they conform to Islamic law. Okay? This is one of the things that the Muslim Brotherhood wanted to do. 
Well, so in the World Values Survey, they actually ask this really good question that I think gets at people's likelihood of supporting Islamist parties. Okay? They ask them, is it a requirement of democracy that religious authorities interpret the law? Okay? That the law has to be interpreted by religious authorities. And what we find in Egypt is 47% of Egyptians say, absolutely. Okay? I mean, you know, very few people are willing to say no, but the, the only, you know, only half of Egyptians are willing to say yes. So then you think to yourself, wow, this is not good, right? This suggests that lots of Egyptians would actually go out and vote for the Muslim Brotherhood. And then you think, is there some difference between uh, voters and non-voters in the last uh, election, right? And there's no real difference. So this is voters, this is non-voters, you know? So no, no difference. And so you think to yourself, well, so basically 47% of the Egyptian public would go for this, so maybe that's what the Muslim Brotherhood would win. They'd win 47%. So what I did was I said, well, let's look at people in the survey who said that they voted for the ruling party, okay? The ruling party, which is the great enemy of the Islamists, okay? So uh, we would expect the great enemy of the Islamists, the, the little Dutch boy with his finger in the dike of Islamism, uh, against the, the tide of Islamism, they would all be people who are here, right? The people who are voting for the ruling party. And this is the people who voted for the ruling party. So what this suggests to me is that there isn't really a huge degree of variation among Egyptians in terms of their support for this kind of idea, but it doesn't mean they would vote for Islamists. So you could, somebody comes up to you and says, yeah, should religious authorities vet all the laws? You say, yeah, sounds like a good idea. Are you going to go vote for the Islamists? No. Um, and so I think there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more political um, uh, uh, diversity and pluralism in that country than, um, and, and it would probably prevent uh, an Islamist uh, dominion. Now, this is a fairly static analysis. Support for Islamists could go up or down depending on on what happens next in Egypt. And I think one of the things we need to think about very carefully is the issue of constitutional reform in that country. So this is the other big issue that they're facing right now, is that they're actually trying to write a new constitution, or that's, that's about to happen. And one of the reasons it's about to happen, it's not going to look like this, by the way. Um, <laughs> One of the reasons this is about to happen is that when the military took over on February 11th, they froze the existing Egyptian constitution, the 1971 constitution. And they said, we are freezing this pending its amendment. Okay? We're going to amend it through a process where we put up some amendments and we're going to let the voters decide. Okay? And they appointed a committee of eight people to sit down and draft a list of amendments to this constitution. And they came up with nine amendments that were very targeted and very limited, but they were pretty good, right? They basically made it easier for people to run for the presidency. It had been hard before in Egypt. The constitution had basically ensured that only Gamal Mubarak, Hassan Mubarak's son, could run. Um, um, that's a slight exaggeration, but it's, it's true. And it would, to, to, to say only Gamal Mubarak can run without saying only Gamal Mubarak can run, you've got to write a really long article of the Constitution. So that article is like a 700-word article of the Constitution, and they trimmed it down to 280 words. But, um, so they changed that. The, they, they made it easier for people to run. They, made, uh, they strengthened judicial oversight over elections. Okay? They also did some weird things like e Egyptian presidential candidates can't, uh, uh, can't be married to non-Egyptians and things like that. Um, but basically, they, they, uh, they came up with these nine amendments, and they had a referendum. They put them up for a referendum. March 19th, I took my mom to go and vote in this referendum. And uh, some people were saying that we should not uh, pass the amendments. Other people were saying we should pass the amendments because it gets us a kind of clear path to an election. In any case, what happened? 77% of Egyptians said, yes, let's amend the Constitution. Let's, ha let's take these uh, nine amendments and put them in the 1971 Constitution. This is a great idea. So what does the military do? The military says, thank you very much. They spent like, you know, 200 million Egyptian pounds on this election, uh, on this referendum. And then they come back with an interim constitution of 60 some odd articles with these nine articles in it. And they say the 1971 constitution is out the window. 
So they've had, you think about the enormousness, or the enormity of this, right? Where you've basically gotten people to go out and vote to amend the Constitution. That's what everybody who went and voted thought they were doing, okay? And then once the people said, okay, we want to amend the Constitution, we want to amend it in this way, you then tossed out the Constitution and came up with a new one in which those nine articles were in it. But you didn't ask people to vote on the other 60 articles. So this, this to me seems like if you're trying to you know, develop a kind of culture of constitutionalism, rule of law, this is a really bad way uh, to, get, uh, to get started, um, a really terrible way to get started. The other problem with this entire process is that embedded in the constitutional amendments was an article, 189, that said that once the new parliament is elected, we have to, um, they have to set in process um, uh, procedures for writing a new constitution. So in other words, this interim constitution had within it a self-destruct clause that you know, in the next six months, Egyptians are going to have to sit down and write an entirely new constitution. Okay? And now, you know, because I'm maybe a cynical uh, you know, guy, I, I, think this is a, I think this is a huge problem. This is a nice photograph, one of my favorite photographs of anything in Egypt, of a protest that happened uh, uh, shortly after the revolution. And this is a, you know, Muslims and Christians protesting together, holding up the cross and the Quran. right? Wonderful moment of, uh, you know, of of uh, of uh, comity between uh, Muslims and Christians. Christians in Egypt make about 10% of the population. But my worry is that by now forcing Egypt to write a new constitution, they're going to do away with this uh, comity, and they're actually going to force Egyptians to deal with a whole set of very thorny issues that the political system is just not capable of handling. And what I'm really talking about here, well, there is, is Article 2 of the Egyptian Constitution. Article 2 of the Egyptian Constitution says that the principles of the Sharia, of Islamic law, are the principal source of legislation in that country. Okay? And this is an article that there's a lot of controversy about. Lots of secularists don't like it. Right? Lots of Islamists want it to be even more extreme. Okay? So there's a lot of conflict about this. Okay? Now, during the Mubarak era, this conflict had sort of been muted. Okay? They'd sort of, everybody was able to fudge it. Okay? But now you're actually forcing everybody to confront it again. If you just had the 1971 constitution, the Islamists could say, ah, well, we're working with the old thing. The secularists could say, ah, well, it's, you know, both sides could fudge. Now both sides have to fight, okay? And this is coming at a very critical, tender moment in Egypt's political history. I'm not sure that this is the kind of thing that you want to do, right? Especially since this, you know, constitution writing process is now coming after the parliamentary election. So parliamentary election will happen in September, and then within six months they have to write a new constitution. And the last thing you want to do is have to write a new constitution after an election. When you write a constitution, what you'd ideally like to do is do it be kind of behind a kind of veil of ignorance. This is not my idea. This is the uh, idea of Adam Shavorsky's actually, where basically we all sit down and none of us really knows our political weight in society. Okay? So I don't know if the Isl I, I'm, let's say I'm an Islamist, right? I don't know if I would win 70% of the vote or 3% of the vote. And you're a leftist, and you don't know either. So we don't really know. We can't really throw our weight around. We'll sit down. We'll write a constitution that everybody can broadly agree on. And then we'll engage in political competition. Well, now what you're doing is you're having the political competition first. So people, when they come to the table, will actually know their precise political weight. So if the secularists only have 3% of the vote, well, good luck in trying to get them to have their voices heard in how the Egyptian constitution ends up looking. Uh, so I think on that front as well, it's just very, very poorly managed process. And I would have argued that there was absolutely no reason for them to need to amend uh, the constitution. And I think that it's basically ensured because constitutional debates always end up in Egypt being about the role of religion, the role of Islam. It basically ensures that the main political cleavage in that country going forward is going to be this religious cleavage, which then means it's something that those Islamists that I talked to about and who I said, ah, oh, probably aren't that popular, well, it now gives them a huge set of issues on which to mobilize. Um, so I think that's one, one thing we should be very, uh, very uh, nervous about. Um, Okay, so the last thing that I want to talk about is, so that's dealing with Islamists, and they're not doing a good job. Okay, 
how do you deal with elements of the old regime? This beautiful uh, modern family here is the family of Hassan Mubarak, uh, the deposed dictator. That's his son, Gamal, who is being groomed for the presidency. His older son, Ala, who is one of the most corrupt individuals in Egyptian history. His <laughs> wife, Heidi. Um, these people have just actually, I mean, uh, uh, all of them actually are now being interrogated uh, for uh, corruption. Uh, and in fact, Mubarak and his two sons have been detained for 15 days uh, uh, while this corruption investigation is ongoing. And actually, one of the key demands of the revolution was for Mubarak to be tried for corruption. Uh, there were uh, arguments that he had something like $70 billion. Now they're saying he has $700 billion. Okay? Uh, neither figure is actually credible. Uh, but, but the idea, but people in Egypt are very upset with this, uh, with the idea that they had been ruled by a thief for so long, and they want him and his family to be brought to account. And so on Friday, they had a huge protest for the Friday of cleansing. And in response to this, the military finally got around to it and put uh, these people under arrest. Now, at one level, this completely makes sense to me. Okay? Mubarak was a corrupt guy. His sons were absolutely corrupt. This one more than this one. But they were both really corrupt. Okay? So absolutely, they should be held accountable. Right? This satisfies our, our moral intuitions in a very deep way. Uh, you know, nobody should be uh, shedding any tears for this, um, for this family. But even though it's morally satisfying, part of me is wondering whether it's politically smart. Right? Because one of the things you need to do is to, 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 you know, to build a democracy is to convince elements, even elements of the old regime, that this is not going to spell their ruin and their destruction. And so you've got to think that there are people in Egypt watching this, right? elites who could actually have some say over how smooth the transition to democracy uh, will be, who, who, who watch this and, and may become more reluctant uh, to um, to, to support it. And I, the example I keep thinking of is the example of what happened in Indonesia in 1998 and 1999. So this is the, the dictator, uh, Suharto, who is you know, every bit as evil and as corrupt as Mubarak. And you know, they unseated him in Indonesia in 1998. Um, and you know, everybody was very angry with him. But if you look at this is a chart of the vote shares, or rather the seat shares, of his party following his overthrow. So his party, which is called Golkar, which is very similar to the ruling NDP in Egypt, has always had about 20% of the seats in the parliament. And they've always been included in the governing coalition. So the president always picks a, uh, a, uh, a, 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 ministers, a set of ministers from Golkar. And you might think, well, wait a minute. We want every element of the old regime to be purged. We want to scatter and burn them. But you know, in Indonesia, they seem to have hit on the right, uh, the right formula, which is, you know, which is to, to give everybody a stake in power. Right? One of the things that we know is, like, when, why do losers from democratic processes abide by the results? It's because they have a non-negligible probability of winning in the future. Well, you know, so you're basically doing that with these with these elements of the old ruling party in Indonesia, but you're not doing it uh, in Egypt. And I worry about what that says for the prospects of uh, democracy in Egypt. And I will note that you're already starting to see a kind of counter-revolution. And after Mubarak was arrested on Egyptian state TV, they interviewed people. And the Egyptian state television bureaucracy, I mean, this was built during the Mubarak era. So even though nobody would probably tell you that they're a supporter of Mubarak, they still secretly, I think, are all Mubarak supporters. Well, they just had a television program where they interviewed all these kinds of people and said, oh, so how do you feel about Mubarak getting arrested? And the people said, oh, well, you know. You know, it's, it's good that he's being held to account. But, you know, things were much better under him than they are now. Okay? So, you know, that to me seems to be, uh, you know, something that you, you need to uh, worry about. Um, and seems to be evidence to me that, you know, there are so, there, there's a kind of counter-revolution uh, uh, beginning to happen. So the final thing I'll talk about is, um, you know, th that, that you need for democracy to, to be successful in this country is that you've got to make it pay. Okay. And this is the last thing that I'm, I'm worried about in Egypt. This is a photograph of a, not, not, I didn't take this, a photograph of protesters in 
uh, Suez, um, workers in Suez, because even though we think of this revolution that happened in Egypt as a fundamentally political phenomenon, it was actually economic as well. Okay? Uh, you know, Egypt has huge unemployment, huge youth unemployment in particular, um, and even if you're lucky enough to have a job, you're probably not being paid adequately. And so labor protest was a key element of the, uh, of the uh, demonstrations that brought down the regime. And if the demands of labor are not satisfied, right, then I think the prospects of democracy surviving in that country are uh, very low. And so what, the, what the, you know, the interim government has actually been trying to do is satisfy the demands of these people, but how is it going to satisfy their demands? They, people want jobs and they want raises, right? And in Egypt, there's, there are no jobs and there's no money. How are you going to provide people with what they want? And what they're doing is they're massively expanding the public sector, but we don't know for how long they will uh, be able to, to do this. Um, so I will only say that if we look at, uh, the, you know, again, I've quoted this guy three times already, but I'll quote him one more time. This Polish political scientist, Adam Jaworski, did this huge statistical study in which he wanted to find out the relationship between democracy and economic growth. And he found nothing except one very simple fact, okay? That no democracy has ever collapsed at above the level of GDP per capita enjoyed by Argentina in 1976, okay? That was the richest democracy ever to fail. Any democracy richer than that has never failed before, okay? So this is Argentina's GDP per capita in 2005 constant dollars, the black line. And this is Egypt's GDP per capita also in 2005 constant dollars, okay? And this is where Argentina was in 1976, and this is where Egypt is now, okay? So, I mean, if Egypt survives as a democracy, it'll be one of the absolute poorest democracies ever to have survived, okay? Uh, but the, and, and so the, the real question is, will it be able to? Um, or are we much more likely to see a situation in which the lack of economic opportunity for people, the, f the fact that, look, these problems are very difficult problems, and even a democratically elected government can't solve the problem of youth unemployment overnight, will that actually result in a loss of support or withdrawal of support for this democratic experiment? And then might we have uh, you know, demagogues who come out and say, well, you know, we tried democracy, it didn't work, now let's try something else. Let's try Islam, right? I don't think that's likely to happen, but, or a military general who comes out and says, you know, let's have military rule. There we'll get order as opposed to the chaos of democracy. That is the real thing I think uh, we need to worry about, and I'm not sure that we have any kind of uh, uh, answers to. And so the real risk is that somebody like Mohammed al baradai who may be Egypt's next president, who looks to us like a great a liberalizer, who looks like the George Washington of Egypt, uh, may actually turn out to be a kind of Kerensky, right? So, you know, the, you know, the man who is a footnote in the history of the Russian Revolution, the last uh, vestige of democracy before uh, autocracy uh, sweeps uh, in. And so I'm going to leave that very depressing image up on the, uh, on the board. Um, <laughs> But you know, basically, you know, so these are very tough problems. Uh, I'm generally optimistic, uh, basically because I have a large degree of faith in the people of Egypt, and because I've always been wrong on predicting anything. Um, <laughs> and so I'm predicting doom and gloom. Hopefully, it'll turn out to be the right way. But but I think that you know, as we said at the outset, what happens in Egypt doesn't stay in Egypt. So if Egypt manages to become a functioning democracy like Indonesia, um, I think this would have a very powerful effect on uh, uh, on its neighbors. Imagine every presidential election in Egypt would be a very powerful focal point for protest or agitation among opposition forces in neighboring Arab countries who would now yearn and want their own uh, version of Egyptian democracy. But on the other side, if Egyptian democracy devolves into chaos, into conflict between Islamists uh, and others, or into kind of old, failed uh, economic policies, populist economic policies that strain the economy, then I think inhabitants of neighboring uh, Arab countries uh, may find themselves thinking they're lucky stars for the stability and equanimity provided by the rule of the strong man. So with that, I will thank you for listening to me today, and I look forward to your questions.
Uh, unfortunately, um, was that we, too long? No, no, no. no. <laughs> okay. we, start, we got up to a late start. Everyone here ate. Okay. He did not eat. Uh, and he was all day um, in front of uh, Congress yesterday testifying. So I'm going to suggest this. It's not going to be very popular because we really do need to get him some food. We can take maybe five questions, okay. collect them all up, okay. give you a chance. And I'm also going to suggest that you keep them really short and that um, we kind of focus on the students to the extent that we can. So okay. four or five questions, collect all at once, and then Guitar some final thoughts, and then we try to get him fed before he uh, collapses. Okay. Yes. My question has to do with the economic initiative and its financial perspective. Since Egypt already has a history of expanding the public sector and really getting people into the workforce that way and then taking it back, how what what, what do you see the economic outlook being? Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Hi, sir. Just like it's a soldier, I'm an army fellow here. Oh no. Okay. So the two two questions I have when you and it's a great presentation. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you put the four values there for me? Okay. And then second, can you, can you elaborate a little bit for me on, uh, on one point, and uh, that is uh, previously Secretary Rice had pressed, former Secretary Rice had pressed Egypt in her leadership for reform. Then what do you say? We didn't know. And then the question is, with the amount of joint training we do with the Egyptians on the military side over here, how does that relate to the fact that we weren't able to We, by we, I meant political scientists. Uh, yes. Um, you talked about, you, you compared the, the trial of Mubarak to the, and, and Indonesia. And my question is, so it's great to kind of keep the embassy along to, you know, keep people happy, but how do you control them so that you don't just get them re-emerging as the central power? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. So, so uh, there were two questions basically on the economy, and I think that, you know, eh, democracy is not very good at uh, suppressing demands for consumption. And there are huge demands for consumption right now on the part of um, uh, Egyptians. Um, and so I I'm concerned. I'm concerned that basically uh, what you're going to get is a kind of uh, regression into the economic populism of the, um, of the, uh, of the Nasser era, uh, which I just don't think works. I think it's been proven that that's a kind of failed, uh, a failed model. And yet, it's for some reason still has a lot of legitimacy in Egypt. I mean, lots of the forces that were leading the protests and leading the pro-democracy movement, if you interrogate them on their economic views, they're very Nasserist. You know? They believe in expanding the state's role in the economy. They were against privatization, not simply because it was, because it was you know, used to pay off regime cronies, but because you know, fundamentally it offended their sensibility that the state should own uh, the means of production. So I'm actually not optimistic on the economic front. Uh, um, you know, how do you control the, the National Democratic Party? I mean, I think that in part, the, you know, you, you, you can control, a, you, you may be able to control the party, you could dissolve the party, right? But the social forces that were participant in that party are not going to go away. Um, and so you just have to deal with them. And I think part of the thing that we have to recognize in Egypt is that the, you know, the, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very traditional society. And so the nature of political authority is traditional and clientelistic and, you know, I I don't vote for parties based on their platforms. I vote for, you know, whichever party has my uncle in it. And so that doesn't make for the kind of, you know, democratic politics that we like and think is good. But I think that's what's in the cards in a place like Egypt. I could tell you what's happening with the NDP uh, later, but it, which is kind of interesting. And then finally, you know, you asked a question about the core values of the Islamists. I think the Islamists are 
sort of take like our, you know, um, take like the, the, you know, the Christian coalition on steroids or something like that, where basically they, what they really want is to legislate morals in that country, to make sure that uh, Egypt is a country that adheres to their particular vision of Islam. And they want to do this through the ballot box. They don't want to do it through violence like the Taliban or like Al-Qaeda. They think that they can uh, convince people to vote for an Islamic agenda at the ballot box. But their agenda very much is reforming uh, society society and culture and institutions to, to better conform with their view of what Islam requires. These are great questions, much better than what we would have gotten at Harvard, so, you know. I wish we could continue, but uh, that was a, an amazing presentation. Um, thank you very much, uh, and we hope to have you back again very, very thank soon. Thank you. Thank you.